Have you ever thrown a party and nobody showed up? That's got to be one of the worst feelings in the world, but if that has happened to you, don't sweat it. You're in good company. In 2009, Stephen Hawking threw a lavish party at a ballroom in Cambridge University with trays full of canapes and pyramids of flowing Krug champagne. And nobody showed up. Because he didn't send out the invitations until after the party. It was a party specifically for time travelers. Stephen Hawking wanted to make the point that time travel wasn't possible, because if it was, then somebody from the future would have seen this invitation and shown up at the party. And unfortunately, nobody did. When asked why he would do such a thing, Hawking replied, because I like simple experiments and champagne. This was the quintessential Stephen Hawking, a guy who took complex topics and found the fun in them, making it understandable for the rest of us, while at the same time pushing the boundaries of knowledge with charm and wit. Stephen Hawking passed away last week at the age of 76. So let's take a moment and talk about some of the biggest contributions he made to the world of science. Albie Van Hanoi, Nick Lord of Awesome, Ben Quigley, Ryan Anthony, Manny Santiago, and many others requested a video on Stephen Hawking. This was not the video I planned to make this week, but I got so many requests for a tribute to Stephen Hawking, and rightfully so. When somebody of this magnitude passes away, it feels almost inappropriate to talk about anything else. Stephen Hawking was born on January 8th, 1942, which just happened to be the 300th anniversary of the death of Galileo. And as many have pointed out, he just happened to die on the birthday of Albert Einstein. So the guy was pure science from start to finish. And the day that he passed away, Einstein's birthday, it also just happens to be my birthday, which is not really the way I wanted to spend that day. This isn't about you. Growing up, his dad wanted him to be a doctor, but he wanted to go into cosmology, which is the study of the universe as a whole, which he did at Oxford and later Cambridge University. He impressed his professors and was on his way towards a PhD, when in 1963, at the age of 21, he was diagnosed with what they called at the time motor neuron disease. Now we call it amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, or ALS. He was given only two years to live. So think about this, you're 21 years old, and you just get told that you have two years to live. Do you go bust your butt to get a PhD that you'll never get to use? Or do you go travel, see family, try to get the most out of those two years that you can? What type of person chooses to go for the PhD at that point? The type of person that wants to learn as much about the universe as he can in the time he has left. Over the next few years, his condition deteriorated until he was in a wheelchair. But despite that, he did get his PhD and continued to find the odds doing pioneering work as a research fellow at Cambridge. In 1974, he was inducted into the Royal Society, and in 1979, he was appointed the Lukensian Professor of Mathematics at Cambridge, a post once held by Sir Isaac Newton. He did all this without the ability to write and a fading ability to speak, which he eventually lost in 1985. If I get a hangnail, I just put it on Netflix because it hurts too much to type. Then he defied the odds even further and became a celebrity. Not many people get to actually be scientists and not many scientists ever become celebrities. Oh, and not many people with ALS get to, you know, live. He was literally doing things no human being had ever done before. Dude was a bouse. In 1988, Hawking published the book A Brief History of Time, which went on to be a massive bestseller, and one of the most popular science books ever. It was applauded for explaining complex topics like the Big Bang and black holes in ways that made sense to the layperson. Now, typically there are you know, science communicators and there are scientists, and you don't necessarily have to be a scientist to be a science communicator, something I prove on a weekly basis. Scientists are not always the best communicators of science. You know, Once you get immersed in that field, once you kind of hardwire your brain to that point, it can be kind of hard sometimes to step back and explain it in a way that somebody who's not on the same level as you can understand. But many science communicators are scientists and, you know, impressive in their own right. You know, Neil deGrasse Tyson, for example, he's got a PhD and obviously a very brilliant man, but he doesn't have any theories or conjectures named after him or anything. Stephen Hawking was one of those few people that was actually pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and making that knowledge available and accessible to the rest of the world. Very few people throughout history have that unique combination of skills. Hawking wrote four more books, including A Briefer History of Time, The Universe in a Nutshell, The Grand Design, and On the Shoulders of Giants. And his work has been showered with honors, including the Hughes Medal, the Wolf Prize in Physics, the Albert Einstein Medal, twice, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the Gold Medal for the Royal Astronomical Society, and the Eddington Medal, just to start. But we all know this. We know he was an impressive guy. But what actual contributions did he make to the world of science? Here are some that we can point out. First, he helped define our ideas of singularities. When Einstein first proposed special relativity, he left open the possibility of singularities, areas where matter was compressed to the point that it collapses, what we now call a black hole. 
In a paper co-authored with Roger Penrose called The Singularities of Gravitational Collapse in Cosmology, Hawking proposed that the Big Bang itself was a singularity. Instead of space-time collapsing down into a point of infinite gravity, it is actually space-time expanding outwards from a point of infinite smallness. It's a black hole in reverse. Infinite smallness? I probably didn't say that right. This is a radical reimagining of the Big Bang that helped redefine our understanding of the beginning of the universe. Second, he was one of the first to propose that the formation of galaxies in the early universe were brought on by tiny quantum fluctuations in the initial expansion during the Big Bang. So right after the Big Bang, the universe went through a period of rapid expansion, and as it expanded, it cooled and coalesced into matter. And it was the tiny quantum fluctuations that caused the clumping that created the galaxies further on in the universe. The third big Hawking contribution was the wave function theory of the universe. In 1983, he collaborated with Jim Hartle on what was supposed to be a quantum theory of gravity, but he wound up landing on an interesting theory about the universe pre-Big Bang. In case you haven't noticed, he did a lot of work on the Big Bang. He stated that if you went back in time far enough, getting close to the Big Bang, time would eventually cease to exist, being basically taken over by space. In other words, the universe once existed in a state without time. Funny thing about a state that has no time, that means that there is no beginning or end. In other words, technically, the universe had no beginning and no origin. This is something of a steady state theory known as a Hartle-Hawking state. The last two breakthroughs we're going to talk about are pretty related, actually. So Hawking created what he called the second law of black hole thermodynamics, which basically states that the surface area of a black hole can never get smaller. This makes sense because, as we all know, nothing can escape a black hole. So how could a black hole's mass and, consequently, its event horizon, its surface area, ever get smaller? In fact, it must constantly be increasing. This regular expansion of a black hole's event horizon, he thought, was interestingly similar to the second law of thermodynamics, which states that entropy must increase over time, entropy being the state of moving from order to disorder. Hawking didn't necessarily think these two things were related, he just thought it was an interesting coincidence. But a young physicist at the time named Jacob Bekenstein argued that maybe it's not just a coincidence. Maybe the measure of a black hole's event horizon is a measure of its entropy. Now Hawking strongly disagreed with this because in order for something to have entropy, it must have temperature. And for something to have temperature, it must radiate energy, which as we all know, can't escape a black hole, so that's impossible, right? But when Hawking started doing his work to try to prove Bekenstein wrong, what he found was that actually, dude was kind of right. He figured this out by brilliantly combining relativistic physics and quantum mechanics. As I believe I mentioned in my quantum field theory video, empty space is not actually empty. It's actually a bubbling sea of virtual particles and antiparticles that pop into existence and then annihilate each other immediately. Well, Hawking theorized that when this happens right next to the event horizon of a black hole, one of those particles could get sucked into the black hole while the other gets shot out away from the black hole, taking a little bit of the black hole's energy with it. In other words, radiation. This became known as Hawking radiation. It's become one of the core tenets of black hole theory today. Now we know that black holes aren't forever. They actually do radiate energy and they evaporate over time. It just takes trillions of years. There are many other examples of ideas and concepts that he added to our world of knowledge, but it was his unique ability to combine relativistic physics, quantum mechanics, thermodynamics, and information theory that made him a true standout amongst his peers and one of the greatest scientists of our time. It does need to be said, though, he wasn't always right. In fact, he was wrong quite a bit. Hawking was fond of making bets with other physicists when they disagreed on things. For example, there was a decades-long feud between him and Leonard Susskind on the idea of whether or not information gets lost when it gets sucked into a black hole. Hawking believed that the information was lost forever, but this goes against the ideas of information theory, which claims that information is never truly lost. Information means things like charge, position, and momentum of particles in space. But Susskind believed that the information wasn't lost at all, that it's actually encoded on the event horizon, which is one of the core tenets of the holographic universe principle. And many other people agreed with him, including physicist John Preskill. Hawking made a bet with Preskill over this and set out to argue his position, but he eventually conceded in 2004, handing over the prize, which was an encyclopedia of baseball facts. Another case of him being wrong was he once argued that we would never find experimental evidence of the Higgs boson. Oops. One of the great things about Stephen Hawking was that he didn't mind being wrong. It wasn't about his ego to him, it was about the science. And even if he lost, science won. And that's what mattered. Over the last week, people around the world have mourned the loss of this intellectual giant, and rightfully so. But for me, it's not so much that I feel like we lost something, it's not so much that I can't believe that he's gone. I can't believe he lasted as long as he did. 98% of people with ALS don't live more than five years. 
Stephen Hawking lived 55 years. And his ability to live that long, and his ability, maybe more importantly, to communicate through all that, was only made possible by technology that wasn't even available even 20 years before he got diagnosed. If he had been born at any other time in history, Stephen Hawking's genius would have never been known. It would have been locked away in that prison of his body for the entirety of his short life. Then again, who knows? He doesn't seem like the kind of guy that would let a little thing like that slow him down. The man was truly an inspiration. So, say it with me. Good show, old chap. This little video is by no means a total compendium of Stephen Hawking's life and his accomplishments, so share with me uh, in the comments down below what do you think his greatest accomplishments were, what do you think his greatest contributions to the world of science was, or do you think he actually wasn't that big of a deal? He definitely had his detractors. Either way, talk about it in the comments. I'm also curious who you think might be the rightful heir to his legacy, people who are simultaneously pushing the boundaries of knowledge but also being really amazing science communicators as well. Um, Sean Carroll comes to mind for me, but I wanted to hear your thoughts on that as well. As always, t-shirts like this one and this one are available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. And I want to take a moment and thank the Patreon supporters who help keep this channel going. Um, these videos, of course, are free on YouTube. They will always be free on YouTube. But it's the people from Patreon who help support the channel through a small monthly donation, but also just by being awesome and sharing ideas and thoughts and helping with research in the Patreon community. All of these things go a long way, and I can't thank you enough. So thank you to the people on Patreon who are supporting. I also have some new people I need to shout out real quick. Uh, there's a bunch of them because it's been a couple of weeks since I recorded a video, but uh, let's get through these. So there's Jeff Kirker, Hassan Ahashim, Jeff Windsor, Aaron Gold, River Mutsu, Tyson Klein, Canada Base, Mr. Puddington, Sam Farange, Andrew Rose, Hayden Haslam, Michael Hasenfratz, Drew Weaver, John Whitehouse, Renee Akalina, Rick Veenstra, Barbara Ribeiro, Javier Baracal, Thomas Kelly, Jonathan Jones, Andrew Miller, Stephen Langs, Scott Bryson, Johnny Casson, Dan Miller, Tim Luciano, Yell Slegners, and Brandon Elliott. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them, get access to perks like behind the scenes videos, extra content, stuff like that, and be able to help define and work the future of this channel, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it and if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out other videos and if you like those, please do subscribe. Come back with videos just like this every Monday. All right, thanks again for watching. Now you guys go out, have an eye-opening week and I'll see you back here next Monday. Love you guys, take care.